I'm always amazed with the stories in here. I heard uh, Simon Sinek talk about when he goes into a company, what he tries to get them to understand. He says there's three questions that he wants them to understand, and they're, they're the what, the how, and the why. What are you trying to do? When I read the text, I'm, I, I'm asking me these same questions. What am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to, to understand this story better, the God of this story. How? Well, I have different techniques. There's, there's things that I implement, and one of them I came across, it was, a, it was a, an astronaut, um, Ron Guerin. Was, it was back in the space shuttle days, but he came out on the arm, the boom that comes out, and he says, as he turned this beautiful earth, he calls it an island, this oasis came into view. And he says, time stopped. And he says, my perspective changed. When you can see the entire globe in front of you, things look differently. They call it the overview effect. When I'm reading this, I want to I back out. How can I read this? What, what tapestry do I see when I, when I zoom out and can understand these stories? But then why do I want to do this? And that one's a harder question to answer. Because I've come across something I think that is immensely valuable. Something that drives me. Something that's, that's, that's precious. And I think it's a, it's a complex word, but I think it defines it the best way I know how, and it's love. I love the text. Now, now, love was the farthest thing from my mind when I jumped into this journey. I love the intellectual pursuit. I love the knowledge that comes with it, knowing something, pursuing the knowledge of it. Now, don't mistake what I'm saying, studying rabbinical writings, ancient languages, historical perspectives, cultural differences, it's going to require every single ounce of intellectual capability we have. But at the core of it is love. Being able to ask these big questions. What does this story as a whole mean? How does it change my life? What parts of the stories are different than the other ones? Where have I heard those words before? And these stories begin to come alive. And I'm uncovering in this, these stories this amazing, amazing tapestry of what's in here. Evil becomes good. Thieves become givers. Murderers become redeemed. And one of the stories this morning is where I want us to stop. I've, I've kind of talked around this a little bit. Ruth, redemption, and a whole lot of baggage. But i got to join this tapestry as it's happening. I love what Joseph says at the end. He's, he's talking with his brothers, and he says, I know what, what you th- were trying to do against me. You, were, you meant it for evil, but God had a different plan. God meant it for good. So let's just stand here this morning, and let's say this verse out of Jeremiah together this morning. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God. For they will return to me with their all heart. Let's do this one as well. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You may be seated. I've been on a multi-year journey through Genesis. And uh, one of these years I'll get through it. And I just keep coming back to these storylines and and understanding it and and finding new aspects of it. And you begin to see weird particular details and you're going, why is that in here? Because Genesis is the foundation of a lot of what's happening in Torah. So it's laying out the groundwork for all these other stories. So often when I'm studying somewhere else in the text, I end up back in Genesis. And that's kind of why it's been a multi- Gener- multi-year uh, journey here. But I came across this picture. Some of you have probably seen this online. Jordan Peterson made this kind of famous in the last couple of years on a video. Um, he was talking about the Bible, and he, he came across this image of where somebody put together all of the references that connected in the text. 
So if you look on it from left to right on the bottom, you will see different, it's hard to see, but there's different grays and whites. It's a different Bible, uh, books of the Bible underneath here, and then all the references in that book or chapter. When I looked up this, I, I found this image. I was like, I need to know more about this. How, what data set did they use? What framework are they coming from? And all they did was use the references in the center of your Bible and made this image, which is remarkable, but it doesn't include location connections, family connections, chiastic structures, names, historical references, cultural uh, comparisons, geographical locations. It is just scratching the surface. There was a rabbi that was teaching a class in Harvard, and he had to teach on the literature of the Bible. <clears throat> and he avoided talking about the authorship of the Bible the entire class. He's like, I just didn't want to go there. He's like, I know my background. I know what I believe. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to approach that or teach that. And he said, at the end of the, the, the semester, it was a, a, a lawyer um, that was studying to be a lawyer, raised his hand and says, why don't you explain a little bit about the authorship and he says, the rabbi stopped and says, well, what do you think? And he says, I don't understand how a book can be so interconnected across authors, across thousands of years, unless it is different. And in these stories, these pages, you begin to realize there's something here there's something that, that allows it to jump out of this historical uh, pages into our lives. And one of these stories, and I, I briefly talked about this before, but I, was, I want us to, to understand this. Why does Ruth say what she says? Remember, every jot and tittle, every word, every letter is in here for a reason. So she says in Ruth chapter 1, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And those of us that have been to weddings have probably heard this. And it's a beautiful, beautiful saying. It's one of the, the most amazing sayings that we even have in our text. But why does she say this? She could have said a lot of other things. Yeah, I'll follow you. Why don't we travel together? But she chooses these words very, very specifically because context matters. Stories matters. These are real people living real lives and now are being faced with something. And history talks. So we're going to go on a quick journey, hopefully, this morning. And I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 12, because we see that Abraham leaves his father, Terah, in Haran, and heads south to the promised land. Now, I love adventures, and I love any good book that starts out with, away they go, across the mountains. This is an amazing story. Abraham grabs his his little family that he's got brings Lot along with him. Abraham doesn't have any children. It seems like Lot is being adopted into his household to continue on the, the family line. And Abraham leaves and takes Sarah and Lot, and they come to the land of Canaan. They get to the land. I'm going to briefly mention this because it's just been in my head. As parents, we struggle getting our children where they need to go. We try so hard to give them the best possible thing we can imagine. And in the studying, I realized that Abraham didn't start out the journey by himself. It says, Terah, his dad, left Ur and headed to Canaan. As parents, we don't often make it to the promised land, but we get our kids on the journey. If you look at a map, Terah traveled further with his household than Abraham had to. He covered about 500 miles on the direction towards Canaan. Lot, or Abraham and Lot finished it up with the last 400 miles, but he got them on the way. And now Abraham and Lot are in the promised land. 
Interestingly, it says they passed through the land at a place called Shechem, and at the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Just make a mental note of that. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I'll give you this land. They built an altar to God and worshipped him there between Bethel and Ai. But verse 9 says something. It says, And Abraham journeyed on, still, to, still going towards the Negev. Interesting little thought there. They just get into the promised land. They're between Bethel and Ai, north of Jericho. God says, hey, this land that is around you, I'm going to give it to you. And then immediately he says, but Abraham journeys on, heading towards the Negev. Negev is Hebrew for south. He keeps heading. And as parents, I I understand this, and leaders, it's very hard to stop traveling. Being on an adventure is an amazing thing. They've crossed the Syrian mountains, rugged, rugged mountains of of Mount Hermon. They've come down through the upper Galilean mountains, the lower Galilean mountains. They've crossed the Jezreel Valley. They've been through this. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Now they're standing on the mountains overlooking the the cities of the plains, this beautiful land. It even talks about it being looking like the Garden of Eden. And Abraham can't stop. And I get it. If I stop too long, my backpack begins to call for me. It's starting to already, I can tell. It's like, well, are we, are we going yet or not? Because I want to pick it up and conquer the next mountain. But journeys have consequences. Because now Abraham is towards the desert and famine happens. Now what's Abraham going to do? The story begins. Are you going to stay in the land that God told you to, promised to you, or are you going to pursue something else? And what does Abraham do? He heads south. Let's go up mine. Heads on south to Egypt. Why Egypt? What's so attractive about Egypt? Instead of trusting God now, he looks at the material wealth of Egypt, the plenty, and says, there's something better there. Now, at a young age of 75, his wife concerns him on the journey. He doesn't want her to be looked at and desired by the people of Egypt, so he creates this story and says, let's just tell them that you're my sister. And we know this, they get there. And what happens? Pharaoh looks at Sarah and says, why don't you come live in the palace? And now Abraham and Lot are in their tent. I wonder what they're thinking, going, this didn't turn out too well. But God steps in, plagues happen. Pharaoh looks at him and says, why'd you lie to me? But then they escape, and I don't know why. God spares them. But out of Egypt, Abraham and Lot return with the blessings of Pharaoh And it says they were very rich in livestock, silver, gold. What lessons do you think Lot learned on this journey with Abraham? Lies about his wife, kind of breaks relationship with his wife to save his position, and now brings back wealth beyond measure. But see, journeys cost something because while they were gone, something happened. The land has changed because in the beginning it says that the Canaanites lived in the land, but now it's the Canaanites and the Perizzites, not the Perizzites, the Perizzites. (laughs) There's two nations living in the land now. He forgot something. God says this is the land. Now he's losing a little bit because nations have moved into this land that was his. But now something happens. They're back in the area, and a quarrel happens. Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abraham's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at this time. 
You have two nations living in the land and two families can't live there? One rabbi said there wasn't any land that could have helped them stay together because there was an issue. Something was causing this relationship to split. And I love what it says. It tells us, because their possessions were so great. Now, we in America know this. Look out across the land and you'll see houses separated by fences. This is my land. Not big enough for the both of us. But their possessions separated them. What a sad statement where relationships took the hit once again and possessions drive the decisions. It's going to cost them to lose the family, lose the relationship. So now... It talks about that Abraham said to Lot, let's not quarrel among ourselves between you and me. Is not all the land before us? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. And this was before it says the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, set out towards the east, and the two men parted company. The people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. This path that begins to happen begins a path of loss. Once was... Lot and Abraham and the household with the Canaanites is now another nation has moved in. Now Abraham and Lot have separated. Their people have now separated. And now the God of Abraham and Lot is now separated. And Lot is now living near, pitching his tent near these people of Sodom, the sinful Sodom. It's becoming, this story is filled now with tragedy and trauma, broken relations, separation, This pursuit of wealth is now driving their decisions. And he says that now he is even living in Sodom. A question I will ask, did Abraham follow their decision that they had together? Abraham went east. Did did Lot went east? Did Abraham go west? Lot went south. Did Abraham go north? No. As a parent, I get this. When I've watched two of my children leave, one will be back soon, the other one probably too, actually. But when I've, when I've watched them leave, it's very hard as a parent to see them start to make their own decisions. I begin to want to, to do something, to step in. And where does Abraham end up? Where is he in the story? You can see Sodom down here. Right at the bottom of the, sea, uh, of the Dead Sea, it's hard to see in this picture. It says that he's camped at the plains of Mamre. He is overlooking Sodom. He wants to do something, but he can't do it. Because we want our children to do well. We want those that are under um, our tent of protection to be okay. But we begin to see this path of loss with Lot become more and more severe. As Lot is living in Sodom, something happens. There's war. It says there's a king that rises up and marches south. What's interesting is that he is leaving Shinar, which is next door to Ur. The very place that Lot, Abraham, have left the beginning of the journey, now is pursuing them. And it says that these kings camped out in the valley of Sodom, right outside Sodom. When you start these journeys and you start to make your own decisions and pursue your own destiny, the places that you have left follow you. And the very reason why Abraham and his father left the land is now outside of Lot's door. And they conquer Sodom. And the king of the place that Abraham and Lot 
left originally, grabs hold of Lot and captures him and starts hauling him back to the very same place he left. This story is full circle now. He is being hauled back to the beginning. But when you turn away from God, this will happen. Now Abram, being told of this, gathers up his men, arms them, and begins to pursue these kings. And Abraham finally catches up to them near Damascus. He is almost halfway back to Ur. He had to leave the promised land, had to pursue Lot. We know he, he conquers these kings. It says that he brought all, everything back, all the goods, all the people, Lot and his family, everything he brings back into this land. But once again, the journey is costly. What have we learned so far? If you leave this, the land, things happen. What once started as the Canaanites was now the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But now on the journey back, it says there's the Kenites, the Kenezites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Rephaimites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Journey's cost. Lot's decision to move into Sodom and to pursue his own ways has now cost him a lot of the story. Now, immediately after this, Abraham is sitting in his tent again. Three strangers show up and begin to tell him about Sodom and what's going to happen, the judgment. And Abraham begins to pray. He says, If there's 50 people, will you save Sodom for 50? He says, Well, if there's five of those missing, 45, are you going to save it for 45? God agrees again, and then keeps going down, 30, 20. And then Abraham says, don't be angry, angry at me for this last one, if there's 10. I wonder why Abraham stopped at 10. I think in his mind, if he goes, if they don't find 10, that means Lot is not righteous. If I go lower than that, Lot could pay the price. Now the angels walk into Sodom. Lot sees them, welcomes them into his home, provides for them a feast. But then there's a knock at the door. And it says all of the men of Sodom, all of the men, it's saying that everybody is wicked. All the men come to his door and says, where are these guys that came into your house tonight? Send them out that we may have relationships with them. Let us rape them. Lot steps outside and says he shut the door behind him. He's trying to protect those in his house. And he says, please, I pray you guys, don't be so wicked. Behold! I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you. And do ye as you wish in your eyes. Lot, don't you know this story? What happens when you break relationships? What happens when you pursue your position? I want to save myself, my position, my family, what's in me. I need to save this. I have two daughters. Don't sacrifice your family for your own pursuit. We know this story. What do you think the daughters thought when they heard dad say this? What do they think they were learning? What lessons were they learning when they heard their father Sacrifice relationships for position. Do anything to keep grasp of something. Self-preservation, being able to continue a lifestyle no matter the cost. What lesson did they learn? We know this, the, the angels say, Lot, you got to get out of town. God's judgment is coming. Grab your wife and your two daughters and leave. And Lot has to leave it all behind. All of his goods, all of his livestock, all the land, other family members, everything. And now Lot is running away as God's judgment falls. 
For some reason, Lot's wife is either attracted back to it or still in her heart turning towards Sodom and turns, and it says that she turns into a pillar of salt. Something I just love in the story, when in the Hebrew words, words, words can play different ways. Um, the word salt is melech. The word for king is melech. But the word for disappeared is also melech. So did she disappear? Did she turn into salt? We don't know. But now it's just Lot and his two daughters, and they end up in a cave outside of Zoar. What's interesting here, Lot has lost everything. Why doesn't he return to Abraham? He's only 15 miles away. When we break relationships, when we pursue our own path for so long, it's hard for us to recognize that grace is available. It's hard for us to step into old relationships and restore things, and he can't do it. And there's only one thing that Lot has with him in the story, and it's wine. I don't know why he has it with him. I don't know if he grabbed it on the way out, but he has wine, and his two daughters begin to plot and say, let's get dad drunk because Sodom and Gomorrah, our entire life is destroyed. The only way that we're going to be able to continue our line is if we have relationships with our dad. And they do. They get their dad drunk. Lot gets drunk. The oldest daughter goes into him and lays with him, and then the younger the next night. These two daughters become pregnant. The first one, the oldest one, has a son, and his name is Moab. The second one has a son, the second daughter has a son, and it's Ben-Ami, the father of the Ammonites. And now you begin to see the story between Moab and the Ammonites, and these tribes become wicked tribes. If you want to study gods of the desert and the demons of the desert, study the gods of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Jinn is one of the, the demon, demonic gods. We look at it as genie. That's how it's been translated in it. Um, but the genies of the desert is this whole story, and we recognize that they're offering their own children on the altars to Chemosh and, and Astart and, and Jinn, and this is just a crazy tribal people that are violent and constantly coming up against the children of Israel in battle. A violent, violent people. And now it seems that this story that we have kept track of is now almost lost. Each one of us has our own story. In your neighborhood, your family is known certain ways. It's just the way it is. If you have a past filled with, with trouble or wickedness, it follows you. Those of you who study your own genealogies can look back and find people in your, in your past that are, that are frightening it's scary, some of the, the stories that you see in your genealogy, and you're recognized for it. It doesn't matter where you go in your community. This family is known for this. And right now, up until this point, the Moabites, the Moabites have had only one story, evil, destruction, pain. But see, there's, there's something that happens in the story. There's something that changes when you read these stories and see this tapestry that's happening. You recognize that the stories are never hopeless. They're not lost. They're not beyond recovery. There's grace. Mercy does step in. Change happens. There's not a distance that God doesn't travel. There's not a place that he can't rescue somebody from. The cries of the oppressed are heard. Darkness is removed. People are redeemed. Stories can be changed. Jeff Thomas, a writer, I came across the quote, and he says, Through the umbilical cord that attached Jesus to Mary, the line of our Lord goes back to this cave and to a drunken righteous man and his scheming immoral daughters. When we start looking at this story, 
When I look at my story, I do see this umbilical. I do see this thread being woven through. How God shows up time and time and time again. When we read these stories, it's not just a story of a violent God or a justice-driven God. It's a book of redemption, layer upon layer. Storyline upon storyline, being redeemed, being restored. Why do I need to know that Lot was raped in a cave by his daughters? Not because God is just a, an ugly God that wanted to throw that story in there. No, it's, it's a pathway of redemption. If we would go around this room and talk about our stories and our past, we would be in shock. And God's no like, this is a part of it. This layer here, I'm redeeming this lost story. These families can be brought together, and God can shine. Christ will show up. The story of loss isn't over. We pick up the story in Bethlehem, and it says another famine has happened. And in this little town, there's a, there's a family, a small family. It's Naomi and Elimelech. Elimelech means God is my king, Melech, king. And they have two sons, uh, Machalon and Chilion. And they run, because of the famine, east. We don't know why they went east. It's interesting that they don't go south. That's a good thing, because God says don't go there again after the children have returned. But they come over here to Moab. Now we can see on this map, Amman. This is Amman, Jordan today. Very interesting, you fly into Amman, and it literally is the Ammon airport, place of the Ammonites. It's just weird when you step back into time. And Moab is directly south. The Arnon stream goes through here, a beautiful wadi that separates these two tribes because they were warring tribes. But we now see that Naomi and Elimelech and the two boys move over here to Moab. And while they were there, Elimelech dies. Tragedy that's happened. Now Naomi is without a household. What do you do? The two daughters get married, or the two sons get married to two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, but then the sons die. And now it's tragedy. They don't have a household. They don't have a land. They don't even have a people. What are you going to do? And Naomi becomes Mara, and the story is deliberately defiant against God. How much more loss can the story have? How far will it go? But there's a brief line of hope. And it says they hear that there's food back in Bethlehem. One reason why geography matters, Moab is on a ridge line. Overlooks Bethlehem. Not more than 10 miles away. You can see it. The entire story takes place where you can see Zoar. You can see Sodom. You can see the plains of Mamre. You can see it all. If it's a clear day, you can even look north and find the mountains where Abraham and Lot separated. But now, Mara, Naomi, is like, I'm going to go home. Why don't you go back to your families? Now, Ruth is overlooking the stories of her past. We see it from the children of Israel's side. Ruth is looking at it from the Moabite side. She knows the story. She knows how her tribe started. It's been a few hundred years, but she remembers these stories of the ancestors, how it happened. They fled Sodom, lived in the cave. Two daughters molested their father. She knows these stories. But what happens when you put a stop to the story? What happens if you no longer pursue what your history has told you? What happens when you stand up finally for what is right? How does that change the story? She knows this story. What happens when somebody joins a different story, stops this path of loss? What if she goes in the opposite direction? What if you choose different words? Naomi looks at Ruth and says, why don't you go home? And Ruth says, wait a minute here. I know this part. I remember these words. 
Don't, don't ask me to leave. Remember Lot and Abraham? Let's not quarrel. Why don't we separate? No, no, wait. Ruth is like, no, no, don't, don't ask me to separate. I know this part. I don't want to leave. I don't want to turn back. Where you go, I go. I don't care if you go right, I'm going right. If you go left, I'm going left too. This is not going to happen again. I will not sacrifice relationships for the pursuit of my own good. It ends. And where you stay, I will stay. It doesn't matter where you pitch your tent. It doesn't matter. I'm going to join this story. Your people now are going to be my people. It's not your family and my family. It's not your livestock and my livestock. No, what we're going to have is, is together. Your people are my people, and your God is going to be my God. We don't have stories of repentance much in the Bible, but we want to talk about somebody switching teams. Here's a good example. Not only that, where you die, I will die. I don't care if we're in a cave overlooking the destruction of Sodom, thinking that we're going to die. I'm going to die with you. I'm not going to pursue this path of my own well-being. No, we're in this together. And may the Lord then deal with me however severely he needs. Because this is changing. This story is now changing. What happens when this level of commitment impacts the story? How does this change the story of tragedy into now one of grace and hope? No longer personal wealth, tragedy. It is now changing. And once was Ruth the Moabitess, once a people of violence, once a people against God, now is the great, great, great grandmother of Christ. We know this with Ruth and Boaz. I wonder when David becomes king if Ruth was alive. I wonder if she heard the stories of David being anointed. This story tells me that redemption is available for all. It changes your name. It changes your heritage. It changes everything about you. Now Ruth is the one who brings Christ to the nations. What happens if Ruth says, oh, you go left, I'm going right? What if she chose self-preservation over saying, no, your God will be my God? Would Christ have come? Your story can change. Your past can change. I don't know your story. I don't know what baggage you're carrying. Ruth had a lot of baggage she was bringing with her. We all do. But grace pursues every time. When I talk about I love this text, I'm understanding that when I open these stories, it shows me what's possible. It shows me that I'm not too far gone. It also tells me that God's got my family. It may not be how I want it, but he's got it. It may cause pain. I don't know why God allows for husbands to be lost land to change, possessions to be lost. But if I look at the tapestry, if I can step back, I know God's got it. And help me daily, help me when I'm in this journey to say, no, I want that story. That's my people right there. And when that happens, Christ is brought to the nations you jump into Acts and you see this list of people that possess the land are now there, redeemed, every single one. Why? Because your grace followed the story. And it's our story. Let's stand. God, we thank you so much for these beautiful stories. I don't understand it. I'm just barely seeing the pictures. But underneath it all, we see that you're there. 
You've held it in place. And it's what a beautiful story of hope, of grace. Life's not easy. We see the pain, we see the tragedy, but we also know that what others meant for evil, you mean for good. Help us to choose this story every day and let us not separate where we say that we want our own gods, but you will be our God and your people will be ours. In Messiah's name, amen. Thank you.